Okay, so now that we've gotten into uh, kind of the lead up of how to classify animals, gone through the history of where they show up in the fossil record, um, we've talked about evolution. Um, we'll kind of put all these things into context now and talk about the diversity of animals. So first off, animals are grouped into phylogenies called clades. We have um, we have experience with this, right? So our green triangle here is a monophyletic group. The blue circle there uh, represents a common ancestor to um, groups B and C, which are different taxa, right? Um, the phylogeny is a hypothesis, and it has been changing because we get more information. So some of the information we have been basing our relationships on include morphology, fossils, and then molecular data like DNA, RNA, and proteins. So with that, we have a few different hypotheses, um, but they all have the general points of agreement. First is that all animals share a common ancestor, um, which we um, said before was a colonial flagellate, a coanal flagellate uh, protist ancestor. Um, sponges are our basal animals. So these are the ones that don't have tissues. They are kind of our outgroup of uh, other animals. And eumetazoa is a clade of animals with true tissues, right? So peripherans don't have that. Most animals belong to the clade bilateria. Uh, your, um, your book uses a different terminology, but we're going to say bilateria for this. Um, so those were most of our groups. This is not a complete phylog phylogeny that I have here below in this figure. Uh, finally, chordates and some other phyla belong to the clade deuterostoma. Okay, mm -hmm. we are going. So on the left here, we have this was based on morphology. On the right, we have based on morphology and um, molecular data. We're going to focus on the one on the right for this class, and we aren't going to use the one in your book. The one in your book does use different terminology. Has a lot more phyla than we are going to cover. We're just going to cover kind of the basic main phyla that you will see representatives of uh, very common in nature. All right, so here then is uh, some of our main um, traits, including true tissues, which are part of our eumetazoans. Okay, metazoans then um, include our peripherans uh, and our common ancestor has uh, a cell type similar to coenocytes and perforins. Uh, we have bilateral symmetry and uh, three germ layers, so tripoblastic in our bilaterals um, and our cnidarians and tenophores. Uh, we're just going to talk about cnidarians in this class. All right, so again, our our morphological phylogeny have two clades within bilateria and molecular has three. Um, we're going to ignore the morphological one and just talk about the molecular one. If you remember, our deuterostomes um, have the deuterostomal development and they contain the phylum chordata and echinodermata. Um, and so uh, actually development, sea urchins are used as a developmental model um, because they are also deuterostomes. Um, and uh, when studying them, it's very similar to our development, at least at the very, very early stages. The Lophotrochozoans then were another group and they have a lopophore or a trochophore larva stage. Okay, so this is a trochophore over here. This is a lopophore um, structure here, um, which is part of that larval stage. We also have ecdysozoa. These, this is a group that um, goes through the process of ecdysis or molting. They're exoskeletons, so they have an outer skeleton rather than an endoskeleton. Um, and the clade is named after this feature, although they are not the only ones that uh, do go through this process. So we're going to start with our talk about invertebrates, which you guys are all very familiar with because we um, went over the phyla in the lab, right? Now, 99% of animals are invertebrates. Um, less than 1% are actually vertebrates, but they don't get the love, right? So the vertebrates we study the most because, of course, that's more relatable to humans. Um, vertebrates are also generally larger. 
but invertebrates are much more plentiful and diverse. So some of the characteristics of invertebrates, so it wasn't 99, it's actually 95% of animals are invertebrates. They're a paraphyletic group. Um, so actually vertebrates are within the clade of uh, you know eumetazoans or metazoans um, but we uh, classify them as animals that don't have a backbone so animals that aren't vertebrates um, and they have it all ecosystems of the biosphere so a lot more groups there as well so we're going to start with peripherans, which are sponges. They have a sedentary lifestyle where they attach to substrate. Um, substrate meaning the rock or um, hard layers below them. They do have larvae with a free um, swimming larval stage, um, which are also carried to currents to substrates. They are suspension feeders, meaning they just catch um, or filter things as they go through their little chimney-like structures and they are the basal animal group of all of our animals. They do not have true tissues but they do have many specialized cells. The structure of sponges, they do not have symmetry, so irregularly shaped or asymmetrical. They have these coanocytes which are very similar to our um, protist-like ancestor cells. Um, these are also called collar cells. They have this ring of cilia, um, which forms a collar, and then a flagella um, coming out of that. They can beat these in rhythm to create a flow of water, um, and they also then can absorb uh, nutrients and things that flow through the water. Um, they have water that goes through these pores, um, and then through their larger area called the osculum, and then out the top. They have an epidermis, which is the outside, um, a internal matrix called a mesoheal, and then the spongoseal, which is the opening on the inside, full of water. They have spicules, which are calcium or silica, silicone-based um, spiky things within their um, their matrix to prevent other things from eating them. And they also have a, a cell type called amoebocytes. These are undifferentiated cells within the mesohill kind of attached to the coenocytes. Okay, so just a blown up picture. Again, here's a coenocyte. And we have spicules um, for structural support and for defense. The pores, part of the epithelium. Um, water flows through the pores and then out the top of the osculum. All right, so we talked about peripheral, but then we're going to talk about our next group, Nigeria. Um, both of these are diploblastic, which is part of their um, uh, development. Peripheral is a metazoan, so it does not have true tissues, and Nigerians are eumetazoans, which do have true tissues. Um, peripheral also are asymmetrical and or sometimes radial. Um, and Nigeria all have radial symmetry. Some of the different, uh, well, let's go through first. Nigerians are the basal group of our eumetazoans or true uh, metazoans and have true tissues. They have radial symmetry and a gastrovascular cavity. Okay, so there's a mouth and this gastrovascular cavity. So kind of like its circulatory system and digestive system all at once. Um, they have two forms. The polyps are the sessile form, which attach to the substrate, and the medusa are the modal forms, which are what we think of when we think of jellyfish. Um, some have both one or the other and alternate between the two, or can be exclusively one or the other. Nidarians also have tentacles, which contain nidocytes. Nidocytes um, can be specialized with a barb which can poke into people or other things or prey items um, to inject poison and capture things and eat them or to defend themselves. They don't have a brain but they do have nervous tissue to coordinate these um, nematocyst triggered um, injectable 
um, needles, essentially. There are four major groups of cnidarians. Hydrozoans are sea fans. Okay, they are mostly sessile. We have scyphozoans, which are our true jellies, or jellyfish, that's a moon jelly there. We've got cubozoans, which are box jellies or cube jellies. And then uh, anthozoans, which are corals and anemones, also are, are generally sessile and pop polyp stage is dominant. All right, so within the bilateria, they have mostly bilateral symmetry. Some of them have lost it. They are all tripoblastic. Um, they have a digestive tract with two openings and a coelom, except for a coelomate. So some of these they always have an ex exception. Uh, there are three major clades, lophotrochozoans, ecdysozoans, and deuterostomes, which we've talked about a little bit before. The lophotrochozoans have the lophophore or trochophore larva. Again, here's the lophophores here, showing this little fan structure here. Um, and then the trochophores are these weird alien-like little um, larval stage. Platyhelminthes, mollusks, and annelids are the three groups or three phyla we're going to talk about which are lophotrochozoans. Platyhelminthes are flatworms. They are acelomates, do not have a, a body cavity. They live in marine freshwater and moist habitats. The marine ones are uh, turbularians. Uh, some of the free living ones um, are also these marine flatworms. Uh, they rely on diffusion for gas exchange and digestion. So they don't have a digestive system. That's why they have to be flat. They just do everything through their skin, through diffusion. They only have one opening that goes into their gastrovascular cavity. Um, so everything that goes in also has to go out as waste when they're done eating. So uh, this is the free living species, which is really important to many scientific studies called planarians from the genus Dugesia. They prey on smaller or dead animals and are able to reproduce asexually through fission. So you can cut them in half and actually you can cut little slices of them and then each of those little appendages will grow new heads. So pretty kind of crazy little um, worm. They have a more complex system than uh, cnidarians, including eye spots, and they can modify their response uh, and stimuli to learn so they can understand, um, not do the same thing over and over again, where a jellyfish will have the same response every time. Um, there are some parasitic species in this group, including trematodes and flukes. Uh, flukes um, have an intermediate host often. Uh, the blood fluke infects humans as adults. Eggs are dispersed in the water via feces. Um, and then the intermediate host infects snails. And then the snails produce other things. So this is another, the, the fluke over here. This is the, the uh, liver fluke. Well, anyway, there's lots of different types of flukes um, that can infect different parts of your body usually have an intermediate host. One of the ways to control these is to control the, the intermediate host. So if it's a snail, kill all the snails and then you won't have to worry about uh, the fluke parasite. Another parasitic species are tapeworms. They live within the digestive system of the host, usually a vertebrate. The anterior end has this structure called a scolex with this attaching head part, barbs and suckers. Um, posterior to the scolex, they just have all these repeating segments called proglottids. Um, they don't have a digestive system either. They just absorb nutrients through their skin from the host. Um, mollusks are coelomates. They're mostly marine, but some of them are freshwater and terrestrial species. And there are four major groups, chitons, gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods. And you guys saw some of these in lab as well. Most of them have a muscular foot, a visceral mass containing the internal organs, a mantle which secretes the shell and also covers other vital organs, and then the mantle cavity which has the gills and excretory pores, and finally a radula, a rasping mouth part for grazing. Chitons, this was the alien dinosaur, like, um, or a specimen on the quiz. It has an oval body with eight dorsal plates, 
And then um, the body is actually unsegmented, but they have the segmented plates. And it is just one large foot, which it uses is like a suction cup to stick to the substrate. Okay, you can see these on rocky beaches. Maybe we'll see some on the field trip. Uh, wait, you guys aren't going on the field trip. Well, if you take marine biology, you can see them on your field trip. Uh, again, they also have this radula, this scraping mouth part to graze off of algae. Gastropods are snail slugs and sea slugs. Here's a sea slug here, and it's uh, these are generally very poisonous <coughs> um, and unpalatable. Three fourths of all mollusk species are in this group. Uh, there are lots of marine and freshwater species and intertidal species. Their body twists during development, so its anus is actually above its head, um, which sounds like it'd be pretty precarious. Um, they can be grazers, or some of them are predatory, and some of them can also be very poisonous as well. So careful with handling these, especially ones in the oceans. We have bivalves, a very diverse group. They are all aquatic, mussel clams, oysters, scallops, abalone. They have shells divided into two halves. There's no radula or distinct head. Uh, many of them are sedentary and just stick to their substrate, but some of them can kind of move through the water and move through the mud or uh, sandy sea bottoms. Cephalopods, these guys are generally smarter than most other uh, vertebrates, uh, include squid, octopus, nautilus, and the cuttlefish. They have, uh, they're predators with a specialized foot or siphon uh, for the jet. They can squirt ink out of that as well. They have beak-like jaws for um, eating. Uh, and some of them have poison in their saliva. Uh, they, like I said, they're smart. They have a larger brain than most other vertebrates. And they have like kind of networks of nerves, which like little small, smaller brains that work together. And their shell is mostly internal in most groups if they have one. All right, annelids are coelomates. They are segmented worms, live in the sea, fresh water, or damp soil. There are two main groups, polychaetes and oligochaetes. Polychaetes have two parapodia, which are these little extensions which come off of each section, um, which means beside feet. <coughs> each parapodia has new meat, numerous <coughs> uh, little um, hair-like extensions called um, chitae, and those are made of chitin. Uh, they're mostly marine, including these marine tube worms, which make these tube-like structures. Um, and these tubes, calcareous tubes that they make, form a reef for other um, organisms. All right, oligochaetes. Oligo means few, so these have much less of the chitae, the little earth um, hair-like extensions coming off of them. Include earthworms and leeches. Earthworms burrow in the soil, and uh, leeches are parasitic and suck blood off of animals, including humans. Leeches are mostly freshwater and suck blood flows, like I said. They secrete an anesthetic so you can't even feel them sucking on you. And so that the um, blood won't coagulate and they keep bleeding and they just get nice and full and swim away. Okay, let's finish this up. <clears throat> Alright, we went through the first five. Now we're going to get through um, the last four. So, ectisozoans, as you remember, they have this external coat, exoskeleton, and they can shed it, and that's how they grow. There are eight phyla, and there are more known species in ectisozoans than any other animal, um, protists, fungus, and plant groups combined. They include our nematodes and arthropods. Um, we'll start by talking about nematodes. These are pseudo Um They're roundworms without segmented bodies. They are found everywhere. Uh, some of them can be parasitic. These are some which make cysts in muscle tissue, uh, moist tissues of plants, aquatic habitats. So uh, they reproduce sexually. Um, and it has been said that you could, um, the whole earth is covered in them. If you took everything away except for nematodes, they would leave kind of like an outer shell of, of the earth and everything there. Um, so some of the parasites, including uh, one that causes trichinosis, Trichinella spiralis. Um, there are some that are very helpful to humans, including C. elegans, which is a model species for biological research. 
So here's the encysted juveniles within the muscle tissue from trichinosis, which it is thought that Beethoven, I think, died of. So, fun fact. All right, um, arthropods, very diverse. These are coelomates with an open circulatory system, uh, and they have hemolymph instead of blood. There are one million described species. They have segmented bodies, jointed appendages, and hard exoskeletons. The earliest fossils are found from the Cambrian explosion, okay, uh, including horseshoe-like crab ancestors. Horseshoe crab-like ancestors. Um, they have diversity of appendages, which has allowed them to radiate um, uh, into a diversity of different organisms with specialized uh, functions. An example of lobster, I used to have a lobster picture here, but now I just have a grasshopper. Um, you can see it has legs, it has wings. Um, it can use these legs for different activities, jumping around, uh, making songs, stuff like that. They also have a diversity of sensory organs, sight, sound, smell, and touch, and these antennae are very sensitive for their sense of touch. Their gas exchange occurs through a variety of different ways. They have gills, lungs, tracheal systems, or sometimes diffusion, so spiracles as well. These are where the air comes in to their body. There are four major groups, chelicerates, myriapods, hexapods, crustaceans. Chelicerates are your spiders, your arachnids, um, and they have a cephalothorax. So they have a head and thorax fused, and then they have um, the uh, abdomen, sorry. Spiders are venomous, have book lungs, and spin silk with organs called spinnerets. So they're pretty cool. Uh, Myriapods are terrestrial segmented arthropods with jaw-like mandibles, some of them bigger than the other. Millipedes have two pairs of legs per section. They eat decaying matter. Centipedes are no joke, and they are venomous um, and carnivorous. Hexapods are insects and relatives. Most of them are terrestrial, some freshwater. They have these wings, which have led to their radiation. They usually sexually reproduce and are beneficial to and detrimental to humans, so that a lot of our pests are insects, um, but they also provide many ecosystem services like pollination for free. Uh, many of them go through metamorphosis. Um, there's two different types: incomplete, where the smaller part, smaller larvae, are just really smaller forms of the adults, and complete mel metamorphosis, where uh, is like a caterpillar which goes into a butterfly. They have completely different life um, or morphological forms. Crustaceans are the arthropods of the sea, mostly. There are a few freshwater ones as well. They have two pairs of antenna, lots of specialized appendages. So this one's for, of course, um, defense and prey capture, lots of antenna. Um, and they exchange air through pores on their cuticle or through gills, or they also have a lung-like structure, structure if they're a land animal. They have glands for regulating salt if they're in the sea, and a hard carapace or outer covering from calcium carbonate. Copepeds and krill are some small crustaceans. These are very important because they form a base of marine food webs. Okay, and now we're going on to deuterostomes. We'll just mention them. Uh, the two groups which are echinoderms and chordates. Uh, we'll start with echinoderms. They are coelomates. They have pentaradial symmetry. They're slow-moving animals, but they are uh, many of them are predators as well. Uh, the epidermis has hard plates within them, and they have a water vascular system, which they use for moving and have little tube feet at the end. They have external sexual production, so broadcast spawning, but they also <coughs> excuse me can fragment their bodies and regenerate. So each of these legs can kind of break off and as long as it has a piece of the central disc can form a new <coughs> individual. Here are the five classes then, or five different types. So we got brittle stars, uh, sea stars, uh, sea cucumbers, sea urchins and relatives, um, and this other group which I'm not sure it is. But you don't have to know these, it's just to show the diversity of groups within our echinoderms. All right, finally we have chordates, and we're going to talk about these more when we cover vertebrates, but there are two groups that are invertebrates, and those are lance, lancelets and tunicates. This is a lancelet, looks like a lance, 
Um, this is a tunicate. It's called the C-squirt, so it just has like this siphon mechanism for filtering water in and out. And that's it. Those are the nine invertebrate phyla that we're going to go over. And um, you have a, a figure like this similar in your book, and you've already gone over this because we went over them in lab. All right, that's it for 